Hello and welcome to Garrity Talks. My name is Lucy Ongai and I am the co-founder of the Garrity Awards. Just like the award, this series will put in the spotlight and in the center of the conversation, some of the industry's true change makers within the aim to drive progress in the industry at a global scale. Today, we welcome three fantastic guests that come from North America, from three different countries. We have Faten al Shasli, who's the founder and chief creative officer of We As Them in Canada, a full service ad agency with a client roster that includes Telus, Nestle, and Cambridge University, to name a few. She is one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women named Executive of the Year and most recently Entrepreneur of the Year in Canada internationally. One of five women of inspiration, a woman, a woman of influence, a woman of excellence, and a diva of color, most recently in 2020. As part of her work in the community, she currently serves on the boards Efficiency One, the Halifax Chamber of Commerce, and the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia. She supports women through their journeys from school to careers to entrepreneurship, through numerous networks like the Women's Executive Network, Women in STEM, Women in Technology, and the Women's Employment Outreach. Thanks for joining us, Patton. Thank you for the invite. We also welcome Jessica Pelanis, CCO of Ogilvy Mexico and LATAM. She is one of very few women in a creative leading role across LATAM, an experience to remember across the main award shows she was responsible for winning the first DNAD pencil for Mexico and has won at Cannes every year since her young days as a creative director. Her ability to craft tailor-made multidisciplinary teams for each of her clients is one of her best assets. In fact, that is how she got her first VP position, managing global accounts such as Heineken, Citibank, and BMW. More recently, at Ogilvy, Jess has done the same with Coca-Cola, BP, Mazda, and Aeromexico with unrivaled success. She started her career as a producer, which helped form her diligent way of working and keen eye for striking work. But all these achievements pale in comparison to her greatest feat of all, being the best mother she can be to Fabiana, her three-year-old daughter, while striving to find work-life balance. And then we have Robin Fitzgerald, who's the Chief Creative Officer at BBDO Atlanta, where she oversees work for every client. Since her appointment, the agency's creative reputation has grown along with its trophy case. From 2019 through 2020, the agency brought home more than 75 industry awards. Before making the move to Atlanta, she spent 15 years in Los Angeles working at Crispin, Porter and Boguski and TBWA Chia Day, where she got to work on everything from BMW Mini and Netflix to Gatorade, Nissan Craft and more. At BBDO, brand partners include the Georgia Lottery, Boya, Bayer, and AT&T, as well as nonprofits, Street Grace, and the King Center. She has been named one of Business Insider's most creative people in social media marketing, as well as most creative women in advertising. Atlanta Magazine also named her one of the most powerful leaders of Atlanta for the past two years. And most recently, she was called the best mom ever, but only after bribing her kids with donuts. <laughs> Don't always, always work. <laughs> so, thank you very much for the three of you to joining us today for this Garrity Talk. Um, it's about North American creativity. So, geographically speaking, the US, Canada, and Mexico are part of North America, even if we're talking about three very different countries. Do you think there is something particular about North American creativity, something specific of the region and the creative work done there, or any trends that are different compared to other regions? I can kick it off with a, with a guess for my, <laughs> for my <laughs> side. Something that I think that some of the best work for North America does, and, and I actually think it has something in common with work around the world, but tapping in and impacting culture in some way. And it's usually driven by something, whether it's tied to pop culture, and that could be anything from Hollywood to the political climate, um, to uh, music coming out of Atlanta, like just having something that is culturally resonant and that is responding in some way to connect culture and, and the message to a brand. I think in North America, we do it particularly, particularly well. And I think because we have cultures of, of kind of 
pushing up against um, status quo and asking questions of leadership, maybe we have a little bit more freedom to do that than in other countries. So I think that you feel that push more and you feel that tension um, when good ideas uh, come through. Couldn't not agree more. I mean, where, for example, the Aeromexico campaign, it was relevant because of the time that it was happening at, in, in the US. I don't think it, it would be such a successful campaign without that context and without that root in, in what was happening at that particular time in history. Absolutely. I, I, I personally speaking, um, personally speaking, like I think creativity is creativity. I mean, as we all know, it comes in all um, forms, shapes and sizes. And I find there are beautiful campaigns that come out of all the other regions, whether it's Asia, South America, Europe, and et cetera. But I find um, these campaigns as, as beautiful as they are, they don't get the same spotlight that North America gets. Um, I find North America traditionally dominate the popular culture. So the way we use, or in North America in general, the way we use celebrities, uh, the way we can have uh, popular uh, or cam good campaigns uh, inserted into popular events like the Super Bowl or um, have some of the campaigns also associated with massive international brands. And even though I, the, some of these international brands do have the, the, the exist on those other regions, um, but if you consider the reach they get in the other regions versus if they were run in North America, I feel the, the uptake is different. So when I was I was I was thinking about that couple of campaigns that I that that I always liked and I always keep going back and just reading about them and, and watching them is um, one of them is the the Metro Trains uh, Melbourne, dumb ways to die. I don't mm -hmm. know if you if you remember it. It's, it's yeah. such a beautiful campaign and very cheek and very successful. This one or the other one that um, the the Van Dam's uh, epic split for Volvo trucks. And, um, and, and there's other examples. There is another beautiful one came out of India um, uh, in the voice with using children, uh, the, the, the children's voice, voices um, to speak about the frontline workers in COVID times. All these campaigns, or at least these three of them, they're very special, but I, I don't feel they have received the reach uh, that, that they deserve. If these were run out of North America, probably they it would have had a much far bigger bigger reach than uh, what they have got on the other regions. So um, the culture here dominate for sure, and there is um, bigger chances for campaigns to to get bigger reach than other regions. That's interesting. And uh, do you think there's something particular, specific, or specific about campaigns from your countries, from Canada, Mexico, or the U.S.? or something that you see a campaign and say, yeah, that's from Mexico for sure. <laughs> I think in that sense, we're still hoping to have this vibe of what is Mexican creativity or Latin creativity. As we have the US super close, we probably sometimes aim for that kind of creativity. It's as, as you said, it's our reference, it's pop culture. So I think in the past two or three years, we're actually saying, well, this is Mexican. Victoria Beer has done a beautiful job, Shivalva and Igno Cuigatul in, in Dia de Muertos. And it feels Mexican. And we're trying, I think we're developing that in LATAM, that sense of pride about our culture. It's new. <laughs> <laughs> and Fatan, do you feel there's something from Canada that makes uh, advertising or campaigns identifiable? I think Canada is, is taking a lot from from the U.S. and 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 um, going hand in hand. Like uh, I feel that we have longer time and longer exposure in the industry. So um, we, I mean, I, I look at it as all North American general, and, and Robin can also relate to that. That it felt like we always have been leading the charge on setting standards. Um, when we hear about you know um, starting by Pantone color of the year. Um, to use a minimalist design that um, stemmed from uh, New York uh, based minimal art movement in the 60s. And we're, we're taken after all that, that doesn't make it Canada specific, but makes it North America specific. Um, 
looking at uh, UI UX uh, movements and design like flat design, for example, and we see, even though the roots weren't from North America, we see how that uh, is used and appreciated in all the major players like Microsoft, Android and Apple. Um, so leading the charge being longer in the industry uh, gives us always um, a head start uh, above everyone else, I, I think. And I won't even say Canada specific, but perhaps just Canada and the US. Mm. Um, and the other part, of course, like um, I, we can't, we all know that the, the celebrities, we have uh, renowned celebrities that that is being used for a lot of good brands. So um, from who doesn't know some of the Canadian celebrities, but we could take the international ones from Michael Jordan and George Clooney and et cetera, et cetera, and which you tie it with coffee and, and athletic gears and alcohol. So again, the popular culture from North America uh, affects how Canada also, how Canada consumers are consuming and uh, advertising in general. Um, yeah. And what is your all time favorite campaign from your country? In oh, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. No. No, I was going to say, um, I have one that it basically is my favorite because it, it began when I was starting my career as a writer. So it was one of those things that I aspired to mimic <laughs> through every campaign. And it was um, the Miller High Life ads that Wyden did like in the late 90s and early 2000s. And uh, like a lot of writers, I have a copywriting background. Um, I, I just fell in love with the simplicity of the writing and uh, how they could just make a, a seemingly like benign moment so intoxicating that you couldn't look away <laughs> and just the dryness of it and and uh, it was so memorable and uh, so I, I was I, I don't can't tell you how many times I tried to infuse that into campaigns for like a local bank or <laughs> anything else be like why can't we do that um, and I was surprised recently because uh, they just brought it back last May. I don't know if anybody saw that, but you know, Errol Morris had originally shot those, those spots for Wyden. And I believe Adam and Eve in New York brought it back last May with some new pandemic spots that Errol Morris shot in his own home. Now, I don't know if it, it didn't have that same effect on me. Obviously, I was much more impressionable in 1998. But um, you know, it's still it's still pretty cool that it that observational type of advertising and just finding an insight and writing about it in a compelling way is still holding true, you know, 15, 20 years later. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it's a campaign from a thousand years ago called uh, Soy Totalmente Palacio, which is a slogan for a retail store. But it was like the first one that really showed how long an insight can go. And the out of homes were super insightful. Each one of them, you were waiting for what's the next one. And they reinvented in the same way I feel the economist in its own country. I think that was happening with this one. And for many young copywriters like me, we were all aiming to work for that campaign because you wanted one of those lines that everyone remembers. And it, it set up a kind of advertising in, in Mexico uh, where everyone started, okay, let's do our own kind of copyright. Let's not copy what's happening in pop culture. Let's try to do our own. Very cool. Patton? Um, yeah, for, for me, uh, wow, that was a hard question to, to pick a favorite, but uh, I think one that always always I always go back to um, there's so many commercial campaigns, obviously, to pick from, but uh, one that stands out is the Bell Let's Talk campaign from Bell Canada. Uh, so that's the mobility, huge mobility service provider here in Canada. Um, and each year, and they've been running for, for a number of years right now, each year it involved a conversation around mental health. And it has gotten the country to talk about it, learn about it, um, all while raising money all the past while. And looking at this campaign, I can say it is by far the largest ever corporate commitment to mental health in Canada. Um, it has raised over $155 million 
and has given monies to over 1,100 organizations, if, if, if I'm correct on the number, um, and these organizations providing mental health supports and services uh, throughout the country. As uh, For this campaign, the nature of the campaign and, and the involvement of, of one and all, um, it went five cents at a time. And um, you can see how small the number is and how the large the impact has become from this small uh, small donation that, that was done. And uh, it, it took, it has been just a great exploration of Bell's corporate social responsibility. And it didn't just help Bell's brand, which clearly it helped it massively, but also a nation's need uh, in supporting some of our most vulnerable. So I, it, it always is like, no matter what else out there, and there's so many other great campaigns, but this one always uh, deserve a great, uh, a great pause in gratitude for the work that they've done. Great. And Robin, you were behind the very successful campaign, Gracie AI for Street Grace that won many awards, including Garrity. Can you tell us about how the campaign was conceived? Yes, absolutely. So, um... Street Grace, for those who may not know, is a um, it's a nonprofit that fights sex trafficking of minors, you know, teenagers, primarily young girls, but it's you know young young men and young women, um, and they're based in Atlanta, but they also have an office in, in Texas and Houston. We've been working with them for about five years, and each of our projects is unique. But Gracie was especially um, challenging and rewarding um, because the um, the CEO of Street Grace, Bob Rogers, came to us and basically wanted to scale up their interventions of um, between predators and these children. So what Street Grace had been doing is they would set up phone calls and you know they'd set up a, a fake ad. And when people would call it, they would intercept it. This would be maybe 12 people in a room making a phone call. Sometimes there was a um, you know a couple undercover officers, they'd work with law enforcement to make sure they were doing everything right. And they really wanted to scale that because you can only do so much on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon with some of those calls. So they came to us with this challenge of like, hey, we want to do this. And we're like, let us help you figure that out, how we're going to do it and make it, make it believable that this is um, you know, a young person they're talking to. How are we going to capture this data? And so we created basically a bot um, that, that learned through these conversations. And we worked with the Georgia Bureau of Investigations worked with transcripts between predators and uh, their victims, worked with um, college students, teenagers, to get some of the latest things they would say texting, you know, just so it didn't come off as an adult, um, and came up with over 100 different personas um, that would constantly change based on what ad we were presenting. Um, and this, this bot would intercept these calls versus people and versus children. Uh, at the time, this was in 2019, we had over 6,000 conversations and interceptions. And since then, we now have over 25,000 wow. interceptions because wow. it has continued since that time. Um, so it is, thank you. Like it is one of those, one of those projects that it wasn't just the creative department. It was, it actually bubbled up from our data sciences and developers. Like, how do we figure this out? How do we do this? No, that's a, a glitch, you know, we're not going to be able to come through here, you know, so it was really cool. And then building the stories, building the language, building the personas with the creatives and, and uh, something that really galvanized the agency. Um, one thing we are doing now as the next iteration, it was popular, but it, it was more of a deterrent message. So those have been deterrents like, hey, we're sending your information to law enforcement. Now law enforcement actually wants to make arrests. So we're in the second stage of Gracie called Operation Gracie, where she is becoming a part of sting operations. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very exciting because we've had to retool the way we've collected data so that it can actually be held all the way pro through prosecution, um, which is different than kind of like, hey, don't do that. It's like, wow, it has to actually be locked up tight to be able to be used in a case. So now Gracie is rolling out in five states, Operation Gracie this year, um, and we're looking forward to reporting how many arrests that she now can lead to. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. Fantastic. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I, I also read your work has been, of course, recognized by International Advertising Awards, but also picked up by the non-advertising world. 
been parodied in Saturday Night Live, featured on NBC Nightly and Entertainment Weekly. How does that feel? What does it mean to you? Or is it different to winning an award in a, in a creative festival? Um, it, it is. I mean, it's always, it's, you know, winning award in a creative festival is amazing because your peers, who you're probably most vulnerable in front of, <laughs> are recognizing you. And you're like, are we all sitting at the cool kids table in the cafeteria? Okay, great. You know, so there's that kind of, there's a different level of like, wow, people I admire are admiring something. And that feels so amazing. When you get picked up by mainstream media, things outside of our industry, it's a different kind of feeling, right? Because I feel like I've crossed over in culture. Suddenly my brother knows what I'm doing and he cares. And um, you mentioned the Saturday Night Live moment. And I, I wanted to share that because, you know, I, I grew up in the Midwest and oh, kind of around, but when my dad retired in the Midwest, I'm, I remember myself being 15 watching Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live, you know, an awkward 14, 15 year old with my parents on the couch watching it like, wow, these people are amazing. I love Saturday Night Live. Cut to me um, whenever it was about 10 years ago, I lived in LA, but I was visiting my parents on the East Coast. And here we were sitting on the couch watching Saturday Night Live again together. <laughs> and um, all of a sudden, Andy Samberg and Fred Armisen come on parroting one of the old Navy ads we had just released the week prior. And I was just, I was like, oh, is this happening? They're like, what's going on? I'm like, guys, I'm on SNL, I'm on SNL. And they're, <laughs> and they're like, is that one of your commercials? I'm like, kind of, they're making fun of it. And it, I love it. Like, <laughs> and, and I was, I was so excited and I was three hours ahead. So I called, you know, I called the team back in LA. I'm like, guys, you've got to watch SNL tonight. They're spoofing what we just, what we just shipped. And they were, you know, over the moon, excited about it, even if they were making fun of us. I mean, what more <laughs> could you ask for, right? So that was one of the great moments. I could, I could have retired happily after that evening, but no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I know the feeling. <laughs> And Patin, you founded We As Them 10 years ago. Why did you call it like that? And what were your biggest challenges? Why did I call it like that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it took a while for people to get it and I'm always asked the question, but anyways. So um, we, I wanted, we wanted, to, me and my business partner, we wanted to showcase the divides uh, we have between the clients and the customers. And um, some of the ideas, also the divide that happens between the agency and the clients that we serve. So we wanted to show that using clever marketing uh, campaigns, massive media buys, that we can um, change that and, and bring them all together. So we always explained it by saying, we equals us plus them. Um, and that removes the notion of any separations between the brand and its customers. That's the very short explanation for it. <laughs> And uh, sorry, what was the second part of your question? What were the biggest challenges? Well, challenges. Uh, so many challenges to start uh, an independent agency from the ground up. Uh, but the biggest one by far was setting it up on the east coast of Canada. Um, it's a beautiful spot in the entire country. But in the east coast, um, you can literally count the major clients uh, on one hand. And uh, that was not an easy place to be. And honestly, it's not even an easy place to be right now. So we wanted to live in the East Coast, but we wanted to run um, a unique creative shop that brings um, innovative and most creative work from, from across the world uh, to this spot and be able to contribute to the community. So we ended up basically um, uh, attracting uh, work from outside. So now where we're at is with over 85% of our clientele is outside of the region, half of them, uh, half of this 85 uh, from outside of Canada. So in, in the US and um, Caribbean and, and far. So we did that without any partnerships with major players in the industry. Uh, of course, we had the ups and downs and highs and lows, especially at times like COVID where we couldn't travel as much anymore, couldn't travel at all anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, but we've been doing great uh, so far and uh, it wasn't just an easy user journey though. Hmm. 
And I read you were recently invited by the president of Egypt to address the World Youth Forum attended by over 6,000 delegates from 40 nations on topics concerning women and their roles in leadership positions globally to speak along the UN. Can you tell us about your speech and what were the main points or issues you thought that you had to address? So the youth forum, uh, the World Youth Forum, which uh, when, when I attended, I think it was the second year that it was running or the first year, uh, it was this surreal place where youth invite only, brilliant youth being brought from all over the world, descending on this beautiful shore on, on the Red Sea, if you are familiar with Egypt, um, any of you, and uh, attended by keynotes from uh, world leaders, influencers, change makers. And I was basically, as you said, just invited uh, by the, the president to uh, to go there and speak about the women's role and in, in decision-making circles. So when I went, I took a contingent of my team because we didn't want to pass on an amazing opportunity like this where all of us and them um, as young uh, uh, talent to witness in uh, this diversity of of youth from our, across the world. Um, when I was when I was brought to speak, uh, pretty much we were talking about uh, the women role and they're comparing it in different countries and 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 uh, the role of uh, inclusivity, but more than that, the equity of having women around the table, women in management, equity of pay, etc. And and I and I sat there front of the president, members of his cabinet, dignitaries from other countries, and you're hearing all the different perspectives about it all. And I think the expectation was, I come from Canada and we've got everything here right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, and I remember starting by, even though we are coming from the West and even though Canada and the US are uh, one of the most progressive nations, but we still haven't got it right. We still don't have full, fully, uh, equity in pay or in presence for women in certain roles or a lot of roles and every country had its own problems and how they deal with it but we basically I gave an overview about all the different problems that we face here and how things has become better so recently for example and this is new with our new government is now we're seeing over 50 percent of uh, cabinet members women and we're seeing uh more appetite to speak about diversity and inclusivity and equity in variety of areas. We haven't gone to equity of pay yet, but we're moving there. And the lighting part is um, being in Egypt with a new government back then. Um, and this is where I was born, by the way. So uh, being, being there and I'm seeing with the new government that they're also coming closer to having about more than 50% cabinet members that are female. And there is a huge women movement that's pushing and encouraging this brilliant women to have presence and a voice around very important um, tables and very important circles. So yeah, so that was pretty much in a nutshell. It was an amazing experience. And um, one of the highlights, I guess, uh, was lots of media coverage, which I didn't really shy from that by the local and international. Um, and again, it, it was an, a great opportunity to, to, to reflect our experience here and um, to share my perspective from kind of an outsider to what's happening here, because it's really hard to, to evaluate where you're at and how far you've become unless you hear from others' perspectives. So, yeah. Great. <laughs> an incredibly unique experience for you. It has. It was such an honor. It was amazing. It was really surreal. And uh, Jessica, you started your career as a producer, also working for MTV Latam back in the day where music videos ruled the airwaves. How did that experience prepare you for your actual role and what did you learn from those days? With sourcefulness. As a producer, you have to get things done and do you have, you have to figure out how that happens. And probably in the first year as a copywriter didn't help me that much. It was a talent that I didn't use as much as now in a leadership position where resourcefulness became like the main thing you have to have to get things done. So even though it didn't help me in the beginning, probably now I'm using it more. And knowing 
some stuff about production also helps me to probably shape how we are crafting the work in LATAM. Mm. Yeah, MTV was very cool, I remember. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I imagine cool. working there must have been really <laughs> exciting. <laughs> yes, it was. And, uh, you are behind the campaign that you mentioned before for Aero Mexico, the DNA discounts. Can you tell us about how the campaign was conceived and how you came up with the idea and also what feedback you got from it? It was my SNL moment too. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't SNL, but it went beyond the advertising world. And for me, that was a different recognition besides the awards at Cannes or whatever, that other, that in every news it was, they were showing the campaign. It was like amazing. And it started with an honest question. Um, each time the president of the US speaks badly about us, uh, traveling went down like huge. So it was tough being called Aeromexico in the US. I mean, there are the main, um, the main uh, company for that in Mexico, but in the US, not many Americans want to buy a flight from Aeromexico if, we, if it says Aeromexico. And the honest question, it, it almost was kind of innocent. Why they hate us so much if, for example, Texas was part of Mexico. So probably your great, great, great grandfather is Mexican. So with that simple question and that hypothesis, we actually search. And what I love about this campaign is that it teaches us what to ask to data because everyone talks about data, but how do you use it? And how do you then turn tons kinds of data into creativity? And I think this was a great translation of data into creativity. And yes, even my mom heard about the campaign and when my mom heard about a campaign, I, I know it went through pop culture. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And um, so uh, last question, after a pandemic 2020 that we had that was very much reflected into advertising and, com and campaigns, of course, what do you expect to find in campaigns for 2021? Or what kind of stories or ideas would you like to see and brands to tell us this year? I think, I don't know if you feel the same, but I think in 2020, brands helped put some focus in the world. I mean, even better than some governments. I think they were the ones saying, wash your hands and put a mask. I mean, brands helped a lot. Probably we have one theme and that's it. And probably we can have now new briefs and new points of view and one thing that for us at least changed like huge from last year is that brand purpose became something essential. It was something nice to have before and now it became something you have to have. And for me, that will shape also 2021. I, I agree with everything Jessica is saying. And, yeah. you know, I, I'm hoping in 2021, we see some more, um, humor. Obviously it's starting to trickle through. There were some bright spots in 2022, but it's like, come on through. Um, I think too, and um, Fatem, you, you mentioned this as well, like in the, in the um, bell work, I think mental campaigns around mental health and yeah. work from brands around mental health is going to be pushing forward in 2021 into 2022. It's kind of like, you know, we all experienced the pandemic together and I know we're not through it, but we're we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're starting to, you know, vaccines maybe by summer, fall. But there's, I feel like there's gonna be a whole other, there's this whole other thing that we're also gonna be coming through with our kids being in virtual school and us just being in this virtual world, learning to work together again um, in a hybrid situation or whatever it may be. But it, the stress that has been upon everyone um, is again, a collective thing we're all experiencing. And I think, what is gonna be good about it. Um, I bring this up because we're working on a mental health project too for a local hospital. Um, but what, uh, you know, what I think is gonna be good is it's gonna start to, to destigmatize a lot of mental health that has, can have been hidden in the past because so many people are gonna be experiencing it. So many people um, are gonna need the help in unique ways. Every age group, every demographic is gonna need, need help moving forward. Um, so I think 
we'll see that. Hopefully we won't see it in too heavy a hand. We'll see some humor with it as well because it is real, it is something we can all deal with. Um, but I, I think that's, that's gonna be happening. I agree with Robin and Jessica, like you, you covered it all. And I, I feel everyone is missing what, what we had before prior to COVID. We're missing going out, eating outside, being with friends, traveling, all that. And, and I feel that um, a lot of us also reach a point of fatigue from hearing bad news and um, stories. And so I think when brands can, can bring the new norm with a sense of, with a little bit of humor and normalcy is what we need. So we need to, um, to see more movements on, on, on different fronts where how we can have the same fun while we're wearing masks or how we can still go eat out or attend a party or go for a concert and just, just to make it, to normalize it a little bit because this is gonna be our reality for, for a while until we all vaccinated and hopefully nothing else will pop <laughs> variants or otherwise. Um, yeah, so we, we need to get something more cheerful, but still um, doesn't make light of our current situation because it's not good, of course, to ignore it and escape from it. Great. So yeah, this uh, the humor thing is uh, a recurrent answer in my last uh, Gertie talks. <laughs> we want to laugh. Oh, we want to laugh. So we want to laugh. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, we are very much looking forward to seeing funny campaigns from all of you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us and thank you for your insights and your time. And I hope you really have a, a very good year. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invite and lovely meeting you both. You too, thank you. Cheers. Inspiring okay. lunch, all right? <laughs> yes, very much so. <laughs>